Climate change is one of those overreaching events that is actually affecting the entire planet. It's very rare that any event that humans do does this. We are getting that powerful, we are getting that strong, we're getting that careless. We know what's happening with climate change, not because of, of hypotheses that are unproven, not because of just computer uh, manipulations, but because hundreds, thousands of scientists are in the field every year making really um, strong professional observations about nature and repeating them year after year and making a record. And they can see this change and they can correlate it with what's happening with the climate. And when somebody says, I don't believe in global warming, you ask them, do you believe in evidence? Do you believe in preponderance of evidence? Because if you don't, you're just irrational. When you take a complex subject like this, some parts of the problem are well established. It's warming. That's established beyond doubt. Uh, humans are responsible for most of the last uh, 30 to 50 years of warming. IPCC called that very likely, greater than 9 and 10. It's such an overwhelming case that, that we call that very likely. Those are in the well-established category. The number of systems that are becoming impacted in a significant way, some dangerously, is now demonstrated. Nature has cooperated with theory and we're starting to get people's attention. You know, how many fires in the West, uh, intensified hurricanes, melted arctics, and disappearing glaciers does it take before people decide maybe something really is going on? In 1979, when they started the satellite views of the Arctic, they were able to get this picture at the point of least ice in the late summer. This was 1979. Last summer, this is what it looked like. The area of open water now is twice the size of California and more. At the other end of the world, in Antarctica, the same effects are beginning to happen. And all around the fringes of Antarctica, there are glaciers moving faster, they're thinning, they're putting more ice into the Antarctic Ocean, which eventually will um, increase sea level rise. And the most current information we have is that these glaciers in both Greenland and in Antarctica are measurably moving faster. So that the predictions that were given even last fall, that sea level would rise maybe um, two feet by the end of this, this present century, are already being shown to be um, very conservative. The people studying the glaciers now are saying a meter, maybe more, um, it may be even before the end of this century in terms of sea level rise from melting glaciers. As for wildlife, the biggest effect of this loss of sea ice and all this open water is on the polar bear. This mammal that is adapted for the ice does not belong on, on dry land and increasingly they are being malnourished, they're having below weight babies, they're definitely being affected by the loss of sea ice. But what I found in Alaska is that there are a lot of humans affected up there also. This is a village called Kivalina, which is a Native American village on the coast of the Bering Strait. This is a traditional hunting spot, and when they first founded it, of course, in the summer, there was still lots of ice around, there would still be lots of frozen tundra in the background. Now you see lots of green tundra, no ice whatsoever, which means that if there are any waves coming in, they erode. The permafrost is starting to thaw. In a nearby area called uh, Shishmaref, another village, they're suffering such heavy erosion from the fact that there's not enough sea ice to protect them from big waves that they voted to move. This is for 500 members of the Inupiat uh, Native American group that is moving to a place that is not their traditional home. What that means to their culture, of course, remains to be seen. But the fact that um, Native peoples that happen to be American citizens also are being forced to move because of climate change is quite an important event, I think, and something that people need to pay attention to. So with all this melting, the ice is melting, the water's going into the oceans, the oceans are measurably rising in sea level. The sea level rise uh, at present time is about twice what it was throughout the 20th century. Expected to get much higher, as I said, perhaps a meter, perhaps more by the end of this century. But people are already suffering from it. This is Tuvalu, the smallest nation in the world, 11,000 people, very remote part of the Pacific Ocean. And the whole place is no more than about four meters high in any case, and that is a piece of dirt that was pushed up by a bulldozer to make the airstrip in World War II. What's happening now is that the water on even quiet still days is coming right up into their neighborhoods. Importantly, it's coming into their water supply. It's coming into the roots of their plants. So long before Tuvalu and other islands is actually swamped by the high tides, it's going to become uninhabitable. 
And Tuvalu is actually uh, actively thinking now about where they could move, possibly New Zealand. Um, and again, this is a big implication that most people have not thought about. The idea that a sovereign nation, a member of the UN, would have to move because of climate change. This is Bangladesh. This is the largest nation that is in a delta area that is subject to sea level, 140 million people. And so you can see they have a lot of normal erosion, but look how close they are to, say, a meter of sea level rise. This interested me because I know that, that they rely on rice. The rice is right there. They were going to lose 20 to 40 percent of the rice crop with a meter sea level rise. I came to this particular scene that was really striking to me. This is the end of a road that's been eroded away. As I say, erosion is pretty normal. It turns out there are about 87 people in that picture. That number of Bangladeshis is equal to one American when it comes to their per capita CO2 emissions in a year. Bird migrations are early in most places in the world, and we know this because guys like this in England um, misnet the birds, ban them or check the band, keep very meticulous records. This is the checker spot, which actually uh, is a western species throughout California. It's no longer found in the southern part of its range, which extended down to Mexico. It's found more and more now up in British Columbia. This temperature change in this region of a degree or more has moved the entire range to the north. This is familiar to gardeners. This is the hardiness zone. It's based on how much it freezes in a particular area. So here's 1990. Now, especially watch the Midwest, because those zones are easier to tell apart. 2006. The zones are moving north. Here's a map that's actually easier to see. This is the difference map. So the pink areas are the areas that change an entire zone. And this has implications not just for gardeners, but it has implications for where we're going to grow wheat and corn and other crops that are sensitive to the, um, the average daily temperature and the day, that days of frost and, and of so forth throughout the year. Another big issue about climate change, we are actually affecting the oceans in a way that was not even guessed at even five years ago. Um, the temperature of the ocean has gone up about a degree, especially the surface ocean. Um, they've been measuring that for some time. That's to be expected as the atmosphere heated up. But one thing that they hadn't expected was a change in ocean chemistry. The basic world cycle here, we get most of our oxygen from the plankton, the, the phytoplankton, the, the little tiny plants in the ocean water. If we disrupt this system, then we're really messing with the base of the food chain the base of the oxygen chain on our planet. I wanted to talk a little bit about cities. There are so much going on in cities. Now it, they are so much more important because now half of the people in the planet live in an urban area. But a lot of cities in the world that have not developed as fast as we have in the United States are trying to follow our lead. This is Beijing. It was a clear day when I photographed this, but it looks, it might as well be LA except for the language on the signs. If they keep going in that direction without some encouragement from the rest of the world to change in, into different kinds of transportation modes, they're going to add more and more to the problem. This is where they're heading. This is where we've been. This is a freeway in Los Angeles. Um, Richard talks about how a mile of this kind of freeway is more than the whole yearly budget of Amtrak. It's one of those subsidy issues that we have to just turn 180 in order to get where we're going. This is what we should keep in mind, that everything we do is creating clouds of CO2 that we can't even see and that we have to try to take care of by changing our energy sources. Cities use a huge amount of energy. They're only 2% of the planet, but they use like two-thirds or three-quarters of the resources of the planet, but that's also half the people. So the energy that's there, the intelligence that's there, the money that's there should be able to lead us to make these incredible changes that we need to make.